Hello, hello, and welcome to Dialogue, a true crime conversation. I'm your host, Rebecca Sebastian, and we've been in this summer series, which I don't think I've mentioned in a couple weeks, but as you've probably noticed, I am offering up here on the main feed past episodes that were just previously published and available for patrons only. One of the fun initiatives I have over there is an entirely different podcast called Trialogue. And it's just like what it sounds. It's a conversation around cases. And when Derek Chauvin's sentence came out, I really talked to a lot of people about it because I felt it was so important and significant and historic, really. So today on the main feed, I am posting a previous Trialogue episode, and my guest is Matthew Horace. Now, if his name sounds familiar, it's because he's been on Dialogue. He was on Dialogue last year in 2020 not long after the George Floyd murder. Matthew wrote a book called The Black and the Blue, and it's truly become one of my go-to resources on law enforcement and police reform. And that's because Matthew himself is a former law enforcement officer, and he is now a frequent guest on news outlets, and he's a security analyst at the Mayo Clinic. He's worked in federal law enforcement, local. He's had various titles of leadership, and he is just so equipped to talk about this. I was so grateful he jumped right on the phone and we got right into the Derek Chauvin sentence and what we might expect moving forward. Now, before you listen to that, one quick announcement. There is going to be an announcement. My announcement is that there's an announcement coming in two weeks, so do stay tuned. There is a new episode next week, and then the following week, there will be an announcement about the future of Dialogue, and I don't want anyone to miss it. So please, if you're not already, follow me on Instagram at DialoguePod. Follow me on Twitter at DialoguePod. And most importantly, if you have not already, please subscribe to my newsletter because that will be the best vehicle to get you the information that you might really want moving forward. You can go to my website, rebeccasebastian.com and there will be a pop-up where my newsletter will be available. You can sign in right there or you can scroll all the way to the bottom where you will find another opportunity to sign up. Again, it's rebeccasebastian.com. That will be in the show notes as will Matthew's original episode that previously aired a year ago. A link to hear that, as well as a link to his book, The Black and the Blue, A Cop Reveals the Crimes, Racism, and Injustice in America's Law Enforcement. Okay, with that, here's Matthew Horace. It's Rebecca. Thank you so much for being a patron on my new Patreon. This is the second episode of Trialogue. I spoke with Matthew Horace, who has been on Dialogue before. If you haven't heard that interview, it's season one, episode 56, and great conversation around police reform. I have him back to talk about the Derek Chauvin verdict, and Matthew thinks what's coming ahead is is even more important than the verdict. Listen now to hear what that is. Matthew is an author, speaker, security analyst, law enforcement expert. He's often on CNN and other major news outlets reporting and speaking on law enforcement. And he's the author of the wonderful book, The Black and the Blue, A Cop Reveals the Crimes, Racism, and Justice in America's Law Enforcement. And that was a book that was really helpful to me in 2020 when I was trying to start thinking about all of this in light of current events in the country. So I was thrilled to have Matthew back on. Please enjoy this conversation with Matthew Horace. Okay, here we are. Matthew, thank you so much for joining me. This is uh, Trialogue, a podcast companion to Dialogue, and you are on the top of my list for people to talk to about Derek Chauvin's trial, which we just got the verdict, I guess, just about a week ago now. And you're very close to it, not only by way of your work, but geography, right? You're in the greater Minneapolis area, not too far. Very much so. Thank you for having me. And yeah, I think everyone in Minnesota has been impacted by this tragedy and the ensuing events with the trial. And now with the verdict, I think you saw the community take uh, more or less a sigh of relief that there was some closure to this case, if you will, both for people in the community, for the victims, for the police. I think everyone 
wanted this to be over. So we're one step away to sentencing in a couple of weeks. Right. Now, what was it like in terms of the climate in Minnesota where you lived near Minneapolis in the last year leading up to this? It's been very tense. It's been a tense environment. I think I think after last summer, and people saw between the peaceful protest and the riots and devastation that the community endured, I think there were, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that were experiencing trauma as a result of having to live through that. And I think people were tense thinking about what this summer might be if there was something else that that promulgated and caused people to react the same way. So a lot of trauma, a lot yeah. of tense people, a lot of stress. So I, I, I could tell after the sentencing, there was a sigh of relief from many, which really had less to do with the outcome and more to do with an outcome. Mm, just the suspension, that waiting to exhale for so long. Very much so. Very of much course. So. And on top of a year into the global pandemic, you know, it, it really it's a lot for for a community. Very much so. So what do you see having now had this verdict where we have an officer not only charged and brought to trial, but he's found guilty on really serious murder charges? What do you think might change moving forward? Are we going to see more prosecution of officers? And is that what you think the solution is? Well, I think people largely needed a sense of hope that this actually could happen. And because it has happened, now people know that it's a possibility. So if there's any question about transparency and if the system works, well, the system worked in this case. I think my concern would be that this was one of the most egregious abhorrent examples of police abuse that I think I've, I've ever seen. Um, and I think, why did it have to take a case like this? to get this type of justice. So I, hopefully, and, well, I can't say hopefully, I know that this is reverberating throughout the law enforcement community just because my friends and colleagues on social media and other places are expressing their, their concerns about it. I, I think that you'll see a shift. There'll be a paradigm shift in how these sorts of cases are, are prosecuted and also how juries view when, when information is, is, when information has been provided that tell you, tells you that something's wrong, then you have to convict. You just can't say that law enforcement gets the benefit of the doubt because they're law enforcement. I think people are tired of that, largely. It would seem so. I don't know if you watched the jury selection, but I found that process so fascinating. And I loved that we got the camera in there. I know we couldn't see them, but the audio of just hearing, uh, you know, who was willing to give that benefit of the doubt to law enforcement, who who wasn't, who was willing to hear the facts for what they were and, and put aside all those, those other elements. Um, it's a tough time in our country to be able to get people to do that because we are so polarized. There's people who, who want to see cops go down for just all the other things that have been going on. And that's not exactly the right application either. You have to look at the case for just the case. There needs to be balance. And, you know, the bottom line is, and I said this to someone recently, I can't think of very many people I've ever worked with that came to work with the idea that I'm going to, I'm going to violate some African-American man or woman's rights, right? Yeah. Despite, despite their individual feelings about social justness and all those things. I've never worked with anyone that I thought that was the case. Now, with that said, we've all enjoyed this um, immunity that says, you know, as long as we don't have any intentions in our heart to cause this thing, then we're covered, right? But I think in this case, less than 27 times, George Floyd said, I can't breathe. I think for any of us to be in a room with anyone that said that 27 times, and we didn't provide assistance and help, we'd go to jail. So I think I think in a case like this, I don't think there's any choice but to convict. Absolutely. Absolutely. And not only that, it was almost extra egregious because he didn't render aid, which is his job as well. So my big question to you is how do we preempt these occurrences? So maybe we're not prosecuting more law enforcement. What specifically, most people can agree at this point, police reform is needed. What is, and I know this is something you've written and talked about extensively, what do we do now? I think now we, we go back to empowering all of our people in law enforcement to remind themselves, number one, why they took the oath. Number two, if they see something and they see something escalating to a path that doesn't reflect well on themselves or others, to get involved, take action, stop the action, pull the officer to the side and do something different. I think if you listen to the tone, you know, I'm, I'm on all these different websites and everything. And, you know, law enforcement is feeling like beat up and, and, and maligned. But if you look, if you listen to the tone, what people are saying is, why can't we do something differently? 
than we've done in the past. That's all. Why can't we think differently? Why can't we why can't we make sure that if it's you and I and I'm having a really bad day, then you take control of the situation. If you see me do something going down the wrong path, why can't you take control of the situation and say, Matt, step aside, I'll complete this. Maybe, maybe it convinces people that these don't have to be the outcomes for the public or for the officers. We can get better outcomes that that meet the public's best interest. Well, what do you think the resistance to that is now? In that case, there were two other officers, right, who you could tell kind of wanted to intervene and suggested, but Chauvin was their authority figure in that scenario, in that trio. Is it this police culture of this code of brother and sisterhood among them that they don't want to betray the other's actions? How do you fight against that? Well, as, as we said in the book, and as you and I have discussed previously, many times culture eats strategy for lunch. So not only is it not only is it the police culture, but in a situation where people are responsible to train others, the people who are being trained or beholden yeah. to that person who is training them to the extent that they don't even get off of probation unless that person says so. So there is this very much of an allegiance to who's training me, who's writing my evaluations, who's evaluating me, did it, who gets to say that I've graduated from police training and get to go out on my own. So there is that issue. And in this case, unfortunately, it, it reflected on everyone. So I'll wait to see what happens when the jury comes to mind on these other three officers. Yeah, that will be interesting because their their role was so different. Um Still, people aren't going to be happy that they didn't intervene more directly, but they definitely weren't as ultimately responsible, in my opinion, but I'm not sure. Um, what do you say to people right now who do have this hostility and mistrust towards law enforcement, even with this, you know, I don't want to say positive outcome, but with the verdict that I think a lot of us hoped for, there's still mistrust. What What do you say to, to those people? I say give people an opportunity to earn your trust. Uh, there are officers, plenty that come to work each and every day to do a good job and do the right thing by the public and to represent themselves the right way. So give people an opportunity, but also demand the type of policing that you expect in your community. There's no there's no question that many organizations in different parts of the country, they treat people differently from one neighborhood to the other. So why, so why is that? And what have people done in my neighborhood differently than someone else's neighborhood to make sure that officers know you don't speak to people that way here or you don't treat kids that way here? Or you don't, you know, those sorts of cultural mores, if you will. Why is it working in some communities and not working in others? So I think trust trust and relationships can be earned, but it, it does have to be earned. It can't just be uh, automatic that we trust you because of anything. Like you wear a uniform, so we trust you. I don't, I don't think that's, I think that's no longer the case. Okay, and then I'll, I'll put it forth to the other contingency of people. This, the people who say we're in an anti-police climate. There's so much hostility. They're afraid for their lives. Um, and, and some are even saying the jury voted this way because of fear, right? That they would, ident their identities are going to come out and they're afraid of everyday citizens retaliating. So there's those people who think this is completely unfair and unfounded to law enforcement across the country. What would you say to them to help bridge that gap? I would say that there are cases that we can cite where we know justice wasn't accomplished. So as long as people can point out and cite those cases, then we know that the system broadly isn't working the way that it was designed. Um, and I think until we get to the point where the, if, you, if you use Derek Chauvin as the extreme example, I would say until we get to the point where every time there's an extreme example, then that person is convicted, then we're never going to gain the trust in the system. And not to mention the fact that there are communities that see these sorts of behaviors day in and day out. So I know a lot of my law enforcement brothers and sisters, they still want to deny that this stuff happens more than you think, but it happens more than what they see. So if it happens more than what they see, they don't believe it. But then if it happens more for people in certain communities, if they're not a part of the problem, then, you know, they sort of they take a blind eye to it. And I, I think all officers, let me use this example. If a surgeon commits a crime in New York City, you'll never see a situation where three million other surgeons throughout the United States come to a line and say, we need to stick with that surgeon, despite the fact that he, he did some bad practices in surgery, he sexually assaulted a patient, and all these different things. In our profession, right, it's almost like no matter what, we have to stand tall. Now, I know a lot of officers that have came out and said, listen, what happened here was wrong. It was wrong. It shouldn't have happened. All right, I get it. 
but you still have that segment saying we're under attack. People hate us as anti-police. If, if things are anti-police, we've done it to ourselves. That's a good word. Um, any other thoughts on the trial, the verdict, or surrounding topics that you want to share with our listeners today? No, I think that we're going we're gonna to see what happens on the next round, to see how the judge. See, the first round was about the jury. Second round is going to be about the judge, right? right. And then after that, the next round is going to be about, okay, young rookie officers, how culpable are you? And how does the public see you? in the sense that you stood around and you watched it. Now, we understand that you're young. We understand that you're rookies. We understand you didn't have standing. But could you have done something in between one of those 27 times when he said, I can't breathe? And I think I think that the answer to those questions are going to really dictate. You and I can talk again in, um, I don't know, 120 days. Right. I think the answers to those questions are going to dictate a lot for us. Yeah, that's a great point. We'll definitely be watching. And Matthew, thank you so much for weighing in on this and uh, connecting today. I appreciate it. No problem. Have a wonderful day. You too. You are listening to Trialogue, a courtroom conversation, a Patreon-only companion to Dialogue, a true crime conversation. Both podcasts are hosted and edited by me, Rebecca Sebastian, audio engineered by Jason Esri. You can follow me at Dialogue Pod on all social media platforms. Learn more and sign up for my newsletter at RebeccaSebastian.com. Thank you for listening.